guys. This is really exciting, especially for those of you who really like to play. I, I like to play with all kinds of things, hardware, putting stuff together, making things happen. It, it's fun. And I think I was really excited about having Eden here because you, through Raspberry Pi, are bringing this kind of sense of fun to kids everywhere. So I thought we'd start with, hey, thanks for coming. Uh, and also getting you to tell us kind of a little bit about why you, we should say what Raspberry Pi is first, for those who don't know, and then why you kind of are doing this. So Raspberry Pi is a, is a $25 um, credit card size, Linux Pixie, that we developed in Cambridge to try to get kids programming again. And this was, this kind of grew out of a, uh, a really bad experience that the group of us at the university had about a decade ago, where we looked around one day and suddenly we found, so the University of Cambridge is, is one of the premier engineering schools in the world. Uh, it's probably the, 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 certainly the premier engineering school in the UK, definitely the premier engineering school in the UK. And we looked around and we found that we were struggling to find enough young people who wanted to come to the university to study computer science uh, and engineering. Uh, and this was, this was uh, against the background of in the mid-90s, having been overwhelmed with applicants and finding that when those people arrived, pretty much the first thing we had to do was convince them there was something they didn't know. These people came in the door with so much computing knowledge, so much computing experience that they'd acquired on their own at home. But, you know, we, were, we were forced to spend the first eight weeks beating them over the head before they were even prepared to admit that there was anything about computers they didn't know. And within a decade, we'd gone from that wonderful environment to an environment where A, we were struggling to get people in the door, and B, when people did come in the door, they were very bright kids. They had nothing like the level of experience they had in the early in the mid 1990s. Why? Why was that? Well, so I think it's still we have a hypothesis. The Raspberry Pi is still we only still have a hypothesis. And our hypothesis is that um, people of my generation got our experience um, with computers from these machines that we had in our in our bedrooms that we would have a Commodore 64, Commodore 64, or a Trash AD. I have to localize the computers that I talk about to the to the country I'm in. But, yeah, so people would have Commodore, the good thing about Commodore 64 is they sold everywhere. So people would have C64s or trash engines. Uh, in the UK, people might have a BBC Micro computer, that was what I had. Um, and you might buy those to play games on, or you might buy them to, um, uh, to do your schoolwork on, or your parents might buy them for you to do your schoolwork on. But they all have that one thing in common, which is you turn them on and they go beep, and the first thing you can do is program them. And in fact, if you want to do something other than program, the first thing you have to choose, do is to choose not to program them. So the default choice of these machines is what that means is almost everyone had that experience of being able to at least write 10, print line the best, 20, go to 10, fill the screen up, or something something filthier than that. And then go into your local computer store and type it into all the machines and then run out of the, uh, yeah, run out of the door. And it means everyone my age in the developed world had a chance, if you had any interest in computing at all, had a chance to discover it. And then have a machine just sitting there going, sitting in the corner of their room with a blinking cursor, just tempting them to get more and more, and more involved. I think a lot of us owe our careers. To that, to that very early experience of having a very programmable piece of hardware. And then that hardware went away. You know, that hardware was replaced in the 1990s with much more user-friendly, much more usable hardware, which is great for the average user. But what it does mean is that this, uh, this side effect of the unusability of 1980s computers that we generated very large numbers of engineers, that side effect went away. And so 10 years after those machines went away, and our eight-year-old children stopped being tricked into learning to program, uh, our supply of 18-year-old undergraduates, potential undergraduate stuff. Right. And so you guys in, let's see, February of last year announced the Raspberry Pi. And you expected the goal was to kind of jumpstart this kind of programming generation again. You expected to sell like 10,000 of them, you said? That was the, that was, I mean, the scale of the ambition was shockingly, was really shockingly limited. So you know, we were trying to solve a, a very small problem for one university in one country. Um, the, the, the decline in the number of people was very kind of, it was precipitous in relative terms, uh, but actually very small in absolute terms. So we'd gone from maybe 500 applicants down to 250 applicants. So really the thinking was, you know, if we could get a thousand machines into the hands of the right thousand children, we could reverse this, we could reverse this decline. And so really Raspberry Pi started off having these very small volume ambitions. And instead, you're, you're up to 2 million now. We are, very, we are closing in on 2 million. There was a shortfall when you guys first launched. And, I mean, to me, this is exciting. I, I'm a parent, I have a seven-year-old daughter, and I want her to play around with, with hardware, with learn to code. I, I don't code, I feel sad about this. Um, so I, 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 
I, I should. I have an Arduino. I'm sorry. I know. Scott. Sure. Um, but when, when I look at this, I, I'm, I'm really excited by the opportunity. But I'm also wondering, like, as a parent, as an educator, how do you how do you get kids kind of involved? You do you don't just like slap a pie on their desk and you're like, go make it do something. Yeah, you've you've really got to. I, I think what we've learned over the last over the I guess the five or six years we've been doing pi, and for nearly two years we've been shipping pi, is exactly that. Just putting a piece of hardware in front of, for maybe 1% of children, simply putting a piece of hardware in front of them is enough. And 1% of children will find that sufficiently challenging and interesting and, and, and intriguing that they will go and learn how to uh, have an install an operating system on it. I think for, for if you're going to get beyond the usual suspects, if you're going to grow out to maybe 10%, I don't think 10% is a reasonable target. You know, 10% of children. You have to make it a little bit easier for them. You have, you have to smooth the first little bit of that learning curve. I think if you can make the first hour, the first day, um, straightforward and enjoyable, then I think a lot of people that's enough. You know, um, but there are a lot of people who will, will stumble at that first hurdle. Because we have to remember, you know, a PC, yeah, many children have access to PCs. Children do tend to have access to PCs in the school. Many of them have access to PCs in the home. And it really is only 10 minutes to go and download Python and install it. So children are already, there's already good evidence that children fall at a very, very small hurdle and it's getting rid of that as much as anything else that we're trying to accomplish with Raspberry Pi. And the interesting thing that I think a lot of people talk a lot about, <coughs> probably much to your chagrin, is all the other things, like the adults using Pi to build supercomputers and, and crazy connected devices. Did you expect that? We, we really didn't expect, I mean, we were very, very focused on a very small, very targeted intervention to try to improve this educational problem we had. So we didn't anticipate, like I said, two things we didn't anticipate. We didn't anticipate the hobbyists, we didn't anticipate the adult hobbyists who were going to use the pie to have fun, and we didn't anticipate the commercial users, so we didn't anticipate that people were going to start to use the pie as an industrial computer. They were going to try, try to start to use it as an Internet of Things, as a node in the Internet of Things. Um, all of those things were a surprise for us. And I guess, to some extent, while we've, we've We've sold many more units to children. We think we've sold three or four hundred thousand units to children one way or another. So we've sold many more units to children than we ever, we ever expected. The kind of the bulk of that up upside, the, the bulk of that surprise for us in terms of volume, has been driven by these markets that we didn't realize existed. Okay. What what might be next for you guys, especially given kind of that there's this whole market that how how could you exploit that? Or? Yeah, I, I think we have a we have a perception particularly in the IoT space, we have a perception that um, the Pi form factor, you know, the Pi's form factor is, is engineered for the uh, for this educational market. It's engineered to be a great little computer for children that you can stick under your television and use to learn to code on. It isn't actually designed to be embedded into stuff. And there is a, you know, we see a little bit of evidence of some stress of people, you know, using the Pi, funding it a very, you know, very high performance and very cost, uh, a very cost competitive platform. But looking at the form factor and saying, you know, if only that was on we have people get in touch with us and say, um, could I buy 10,000 pies from you without the connectors fitted? So there is a little bit of evidence that people don't want to form factor. So I guess one thing we're, we're considering doing over the next year is maybe trying to address that form factor, you know, trying to provide an alternative form factor, which might be a little bit more suitable for people who are trying to use it as a component rather than as a finished product. Would that be like an apple pie or a blueberry pie? Yeah, we have to be really careful about one of those two words. <laughs> <laughs> there are oh, oh, yes, yes, you would. <laughs> yes, just up the road. You know. Uh, I was just thinking of the most delicious pies. Um, Interesting though, raspberry pi is extremely hard to make a tasty raspberry pi. It is, the seeds are kind of... Yeah, the ra they, they, melt away to, they melt away to nothing. So what you actually do is, the, the way to make a good raspberry pi is... is uh, <laughs> well, just in case, because people, so, people do sometimes make us a raspberry pi if we go for a visit somewhere. Um, uh, we, people do make us a raspberry pi. The trick is to make a custard, like a little custard pie, with raspberries on top. Uh, and so a, raspberry, a, raspberry a raspberry tart with a little coolie. Every, everyone noted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going on my right. Okay. <laughs> Intel, actually. So the pot, there's there's the pie. There's Arduino. There's a. We love Arduino. There's Beagle Beagle Bo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was, and it, th there's a bunch of kind of these hobbyist kind of computers out there, and Intel just did their Galileo board. So I'm I'm curious, kind of how you see 
the comp is it competition? Is it just more fun? I mean, yeah, I think so, I think so far it's I think so far it's more yeah, all of those boards add something new to the space. It isn't so much that we're kind of fighting over a fixed size pie, uh, but that we are uh, just the puns are on themselves. Um, but you know, we're not fighting over a fixed size pie. We're we're kind of uh, all of these platforms bring new things. So for Galway is a great example of that, which brings X86, the, the ability to run X86, um, the X86 instruction set in a uh, in an Arduino-like mobile form factor um, is it's a really useful new thing. You know, so all of these things, I think they all move the market forward. One of the things I think very early on there was a feeling that maybe we would take market away from Arduino. And I don't think that there's any real evidence that's happened. I think that the sorts of things people can do with Pi and the sorts of things people can do with Arduino, there's a little overlap. So you know, maybe we've taken away 10% of Arduino's potential applications, but by kind of popularizing the idea of cheap small computers, we've probably generated much more additional volume for Arduino. And certainly we see that with new things coming into the field. They just increase the amount of excitement around these kind of IoT platforms. And what are you what are some of the most exciting or fun projects that you have seen? So I'm a so I'm a child of the 80s, so I'm a real space cadet. Um, the ones I like most are the space ones. Uh, and the, so there's a, there's a chap in the UK called Dave Ackerman who puts these things under weather balloons and sends them up. We have a camera add-on. We don't generally um, do add-on boards for the pilot. We did like a $21.5 megapixel camera board. And Dave has been putting these other balloons, these weather balloons, uh, hydrogen weather balloons, which is kind of fun because you're filling up this giant balloon with hydrogen. Um, and because you want it to go up very high, yeah. I was thinking it might explode. That yeah, which is what's cool about it. So, so, so you, uh, if you've ever seen the Prisoner, um, the, 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 if you want these things to go up nice and high, you want to fill them so they're marginally buoyant at, 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 at ground level. And so the thing just wobbles up into the air. It's a bit like the Prisoner. If you get it wrong, it will bow. You get this big sphere full of hydrogen that bounces across the field. And there's always that worry that over the next hedge there's somebody having a barbecue. Um, there's a big sphere of hydrogen that bounces up. Um, but yeah, so he sends them up and he takes these pictures. The wonderful thing about that is he's 40 kilometers up. And you might as well be in space. I mean, not in space, but in terms of the view, you might as well be in space. And he's doing this on a budget of two or three hundred dollars, um, which means you know, every primary school in the world, every primary school in the developed world, can have a space program. Take these pictures and send out these pictures from space. Oh, I never thought about it as like a space program. Yeah. That's far cooler than the catapults we made, and those were actually pretty cool. Yeah, and, and cause, so, so a lot of what's going on is you know we came from this very very narrow world of trying to get more people to program, um, but I think we've ended up in a place where. On the education side, a lot of what people are doing with Pi is this kind of broader STEM mission. You know, people are using the Pi in biology experiments, people are using the Pi for physics and, and um, climatology and all these things. Kind of, there are some wonderful kids in the UK who have been doing pollution monitoring. They've built a pollution monitoring sh um, shield and an add-on board for the, uh, for the Pi that, that measures air quality. They're the Kickstarter and then have deployed these all around the world. Um, so it's those, kind of, it's those kind of things that really take the Pi and use it to get Kids. I don't really mind if we get kids excited about programming or if we get them excited about climatology, as long as we get them excited about STEM subjects, because that's what we need. It's true, and, and away from drugs. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, even, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our chat. Brilliant, thank you.